Welcome to today's webcast brought to you by DataVail. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director at Database Trends and Applications and Unister Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled SQL Server Database Backups for Azure Virtual Machines. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the Submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question has not been selected during the show, you will receive an email response. Plus, one lucky viewer today will win a $100 American Express gift card. The winner will be announced at the end of the event, so stay tuned to see if it's you. <coughs> now, to introduce our speaker for today, Andy McDermott, SQL Server DBA at DataVail. For more information on Andy, you can click on the arrow under his headshot. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Andy. Uh, hey, everyone, and welcome to the presentation, SQL Server Database Backups on Azure VMs. Uh, so today's presentation is all about backups and specifically working with uh, SQL Server backups uh, in Azure. So I've been working with these tools and topics in the presentation here for, for a bit now. But in general, I feel kind of late to the whole cloud party uh, in my position as a remote DBA, focused pretty heavily on day-to-day -day production, administration, and for the, for the most part, the servers that I administer are still on-premise, either physical or virtual servers. So uh, although the, crowd, the cloud has been a, around for a while now, it's pretty recent for me that I started really digging in uh, mostly because more and more of the clients I'm supporting are finally, are finally going that way. Um, what I noticed is that working with my clients, in many cases they'd stand up a new SQL Server as an Azure VM, but when I go to try to set up best practice configurations or look at performance issues or whatever else, I would maybe find some inconsistencies and bad practices and so on, but I didn't really have a good background on the cloud side of things to understand uh, what I as a DBA needed to be asking from my cloud admin uh, before they handed off a new server to me. So similar to talking to your VM admin or SAN admin, uh, you kind of need to interface with these people, but uh, you need to speak a little, at least a little bit of their language. So I, I started digging in, and the cool thing is here you don't have to have a VMware or SAN lab to practice in. All you need is a Microsoft account and one of their free subscriptions to start poking around in SQL Azure and looking at SQL servers on SQL Azure. So anyway, getting back to SQL, for me anyway, that's kind of where this presentation is coming from, uh, catching up with Azure and meanwhile keeping up with all the new whistles and bells in SQL 2014 and now 2016. So there's a bunch of new stuff all coming together here. And if you're like me, kind of catching up, uh, hopefully I'm talking to all the right people, uh, you know that one thing a DBA should pretty much have dialed one topic we can all sort of focus in on is backups, and so that's kind of where we're going with this today. Backups in Azure VMs and all the kind of moving pieces and parts that are sort of surrounding it. So as you know, my name is Andy. I'm a DBA here at DataVail. Uh, if you don't know who we are, we have a lightweight monitoring utility. helps us keep tabs on database servers, and I work with a great team of DBAs can respond to issues day or night. When we're not doing that, we're helping our clients with project work or just keeping things running smooth. And of course, part of that is making sure the backups are up to snuff, even if they're in the cloud. Uh, so we'll get into that, but before we get too far into it, let's kind of lay some groundwork uh, on what a backup is and what it's good, good for, you know. So let's go back, we way back, 65 million years ago to the age of dinosaurs, way before webinars and databases, Mother Nature made these backups. So this information is recorded in the rock and dirt, and now we're in the process of recovering some of it. Paleontologists do that. Uh, so fossils and dinosaur fossils, you could call these sort of an archival backup. Unfortunately, we can't recover a whole system from this, but some of the info is there for us to, to access. If something like the movie Jurassic Park was real, and we could recover the complete dinosaur DNA, there's potentially enough information there, we could completely rebuild the system, which no doubt would be super awesome. Uh, but anyway, that's not going to happen. Uh, and the whole species basically is gone because of, you know, you could say poor backups. 
that's just how important they are. So next time someone asks you what's the real reason dinosaurs went extinct, it's not what everyone says, meteorites or space aliens. That's actually the disaster part. The real answer is missing backups. So not about dinosaurs, although there's a couple more pictures. Uh, let's talk about what backups are used for today in SQL Server. Um, obviously, really everything. Anytime we need a second copy of a data, we need a backup. We need to save off some data for later, backup. We need to ensure a system is recoverable, backup. We need to ensure a system doesn't go offline, backup, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes down to it, it's our number one job as a DBA, backups. Here's a little chart I made up uh, illustrating the results of a very informal survey. Uh, this is blo blog topics regarding SQL Server on the web. Almost everything at least mentions backups regardless of the topic. So if you're a DBA and I'm a DBA, hopefully we can agree on some fundamentals here as the last slide of this sort of introduction. Uh, I want to talk about backup best practices. So this may not be exactly the way you do it, and that's okay. Just want to lay down a decent scenario or some kind of a standard we can reference later as we look at some ways of moving SQL Server into the cloud and how that's going to change a backup plan. So here's what I like to set up on any given run-of-the-mill SQL Server. Native backups, uh, full, of course, and probably every night. Log backups, if needed, if needed at all. Uh, why native backups? Because I know the technology and the syntax. I can use compression encryption or any other tricks to sort of optimize the whole process. Since I'm the DBA and as we established, backups are so important, I want something standard and familiar that I can kind of go to each time. Also, native backups come with SQL Server. You don't have to buy anything else. So ideally, this native backup would go to a local drive on the SQL machine, and that's great since I can access it right away in case for any reason I need to restore the data or some part of it. I don't need uh, multiple days of backups there on that local disk. Maybe just one is enough uh, to make my job that much easier in case I do, do need to restore that data. Uh, but local storage for a backup is not really the whole picture, right? It's not a real backup. If something goes wrong on this box and the database backups are lost, then that'd be the whole show. So we need a remote copy of this backup as well to kind of, keep, you know, to have it as a true backup. So this is kind of nice, it qualifies as a serious backup, it's not on the same system as the data, and it could even be DR uh, solution if it's kind of remote enough. And it could also be a convenience for anyone who might need to, the data, um, since hopefully it's kind of on some kind of centralized server where other users can access that backup file. Ideally, there's gonna be plenty of storage where that remote backup lands, so kind of we have an archive uh, functionality here too. Um, the drawback with this whole picture, and we'll talk about this as we move it into Azure, is that we're dedicating a whole disk probably to just a backup, uh, just as a backup drive. Um, this is, you know, kind of an ideal situation. Um, as things get more complicated in real life, we look at uh, very large databases, uh, smaller disk size that can't handle uh, whatever size the backup is and uh, maybe a third-party tool, like maybe there's a political reason that a uh, company might be uh, sort of dedicated to a third-party tool instead of native SQL backups. All right, so kind of laid the foundation here. Probably more info than you ever wanted to know about how I think about backups on-premise, but let's kind of get to the point, and we'll take this idea and uh, move it up into the cloud and see how it, how it might change a little. So that brings us to agenda for the day, uh, the rest of the presentation, how we can take this on-premise backup or this kind of the know-how we have, this template we just talked about, and we want to get all that same functionality and maybe even more out of uh, a backup plan for a database or running in Azure VM. So to explore that, we're going to look at Azure Storage and VMs, uh, Azure VMs, some of the management tools we might use to copy, move databases, upload, download, delete, et cetera. Uh, or not databases, sorry, but database backups. And uh, of course, some of the new uh, database backup features in Azure uh, that we can use in the cloud. So we can't get too far talking about backups without talking about storage. 
Uh, so first of all, let's get into a review of Azure VMs and how storage works on them. Simplest way to think about a SQL Server in Azure is just another virtual machine. Probably fairly familiar with that. Uh, just like a VM, you basically, as a DBA anyway, can administer it by RDPing into the machine. Of course, it's not the whole picture. It's not totally accurate, but it's a good start, especially if you are like strictly a DBA. Um, there's more going on back there in the cloud of an Azure VM uh, behind your RDP session. But if you're need, uh, just a DBA, um, there might be a cloud admin that's sort of in charge of that. And he's spinning up these VMs and passing them along to you for your SQL installs and do your administration. So the RDP view of the server is might, uh, kind of might be all you ever know. Uh, that's fine, but like I was explaining in the introduction, a little background on what's going on behind uh, you know, the scenes can be helpful to us as we figure out how to configure our backups. So Azure comes in a variety of sizes and series, or series and sizes. I'm showing off the D series here, and that's what Microsoft says you'll need for a SQL Server, uh, D2 for Standard Edition, D3 for Enterprise. These are kind of at least recommendations, so we can go up from there. So you can see here we get uh, such and such RAM, such and such CPU uh, per size. Those are fixed per size. And then we get so many disks per size as well. The key thing here is that we have some options with the disks. We can attach some of these or, uh, or all of them, or we can combine some of them and stripe them into sort of a RAID array, and we'll get into that later. Uh, but so in Azure, just like it's kind of always been on-premise, a uh, good part of provisioning and managing SQL Server is figuring out this storage piece. And of course, since database backups are in general going to go to file, we need to also consider how the storage is going to work for our backup solution. So now we'll take a closer look at Azure Storage. So when you or your cloud admin builds a new SQL, uh, or sorry, a new Azure Windows Server, comes with CMD drives right out of the box. Um, all the other storage disks, the ones we just talked about in the last drive, uh, last slide, sorry, need to be attached to it. Uh, but first we must kind of create them within a storage account. So these storage accounts are hosted on storage stamps, which is a big group of disks uh, up in the cloud, sort of analogous to a SAN. Uh, within each one of these stamps, there are so many disks providing some similar IOPS and each stamp has its own kind of fault and update domain. So that means if a switch or something fails on the top of a particular stamp, that whole stamp is going down. And it means when it's time for updates, that whole stamp might be down for updates. So Microsoft is guaranteeing uh, three and a half ninth availability for this Azure stuff, and there's no way that's going to happen if your database disk is somewhere on a stamp and that stamp is failing or undergoing some update process. So to keep the data available, it's replicated. So when you or, you or I uh, create a disk in Azure and we drop a database in there, that database data is replicated three times over distinct fault and update domains. Three writes, sounds kind of slow, uh, maybe, maybe not, but it's a bit off topic, but that's one reason we always want to ensure that we're using instant file initiation uh, on our uh, SQL Server operating systems. And definitely we're always going to want to use compression when we do our backups. So we're getting these three writes, but we might as well keep those writes reduced as much as possible. So something like backup compression is going to help us there. Anyway, as far as the redundancy goes, it's pretty good. We're in good shape here. So that's pretty much the most basic, simple looking storage that I just described. Uh, and that's called locally redundant storage. But there's quite a bit other options out there that they'll uh, let us use. And this is what we have available. So we have that local redundant storage, geo-replicated storage, read access, geo-replicated, zone replicated, and premium local redundant storage. Um, we're not going to actually get into zone replicated storage, but we'll touch on each one of these other ones uh, and get into a little bit of the details of them. So local storage, uh, you get those, that's hard disks. Uh, you pay for what you use. You get shared IOPS kind of a model, so you never know exactly what you're going to get. And you get that three-time redundancy we talked about. 
The other option for local storage is premium. Uh, and here you get a solid state disk, a uh, fixed size that you pay for, and a dedicated IOPS you, you're going to pay for too. And you still get that same three time redundancy. Either of these two are okay for database files. Uh, but in general, you wouldn't really need premium storage for backups. And in general, you'd be better off with data files on the premium disks that are faster. So that kind of leads local storage as a great place for backups, since in general, maybe usually we don't need too much speed there, and we can keep things cheaper since we only have to you know, pay for what we use. So on that, we move on to the remote storage here. Very similar to local storage, except the three replicas also get replicated to a remote site. So now we have six replicas. Three of them are often in a remote site in another region that's at least 100 miles away. And Microsoft kind of, they decide what the pairs are for the primary and secondary sites. Read access geo-replicated, uh, basically the same deal, but you can read off of those, off of that remote copy of the data. So can't do database files here since this geo-replication, there's not transactionally consistent. You wouldn't be able to uh, guarantee that that remote site is the same as your local site. However, you have a pretty interesting uh, setup here if one of these is your backup destination. Uh, if you want to make sure that those backups are available on sort of a disaster, re disaster recovery kind of level, uh, that read access could be also kind of a cool way to share data across regions. And we'll kind of touch on this a little bit more in later slides. So the next question we need to ask is, uh, now that we know about these storage accounts, how are we going to access them? Uh, so far, we've sort of assumed that a disk would be sitting in these storage accounts, and that's correct. But there's a little more to them than that. We can also access them directly through URL endpoints. So here's a look at uh, what's going on with uh, accessing, a, sorry, accessing a storage account with a, uh, via URL. So we need a name for the account. And within that account, we'll create a container. It's sort of like a subdirectory. Uh, we can have many, many, I think you have unlimited uh, of these containers within a storage account. And then we build the URL out of this blob core.windows.net HTTPS address. You can customize that uh, if you like, but this is kind of the default kind of format. And lastly, we need this key, uh, more or less our password into the storage account. So that's the basics, as you'll see in the demo coming up. You don't have to like take notes of any of this stuff or write it down. Uh, you can just copy and paste this info from the Azure portal uh, as you need it. Uh, but the thing is, as a DBA, these few things here are just about all you need really to manage a storage account and the files within it and build up any number of backup solutions for your SQL Server running in Azure. Uh, okay, so that's the URL kind of thing. Uh, let's get back to the disk side, since uh, that could be part of our backup plan as well. So the one thing here I kind of wanted to point out or bring up is storage pools in Windows 2012, Windows Server 2012. So here uh, we attach the, the disk to the, the VM like you already saw, and we see those disks as a part of a, well, a big pool of storage, basically. Uh, we can carve out a slice of uh, that storage across a number of disks as a virtual drive. Basically, you think of it as a RAID 1 array. So now we have all that storage and IOPS of each of the, the disks combined. RAID 5 is an option as well. But we don't need RAID 5 at this level because we have those three redundant copies down at the storage account level. So we just need the RAID 1. So it's pretty cool. So we'll go into a demo at this point and take a look at Azure VMs and Azure Storage. It's a pre-recorded thing. I'm going to try to kind of ad lib over it. And if the resolution is not so good, you can try uh, going full screen or something. I think there's an option for you to do that. But uh, even if it's not completely clear, hopefully you get the idea. Here's what we're going to do. So I got a virtual machine already created here. It's got seven gig of memory, two cores. It's a DS2. 
So that DS2 means I can attach premium storage, and I get four disks with that. So I attached these four disks already. And I set up two of them and premium as SSDs. And I set two of them up as standard local redundant storage. So each one of those has their own storage account. We want to look at this these same disks from the storage account perspective. You can go back out here to storage accounts. We're going to look at that LRS one I built. Within the storage account, we're looking at the blob service. Within there, we're going to look at this container, that subdirectory we talked about. And there's those two disks. So if we're setting up a backup solution in SQL Server 2014 on a Windows Azure, we don't necessarily want to use those data. You know, we kind of want to dedicate those to, to, our, to our data. So in, for backups, we can build a dedicated storage account just for backups for a blob service. In this case, we need to create a container to send our backups to. We'll call it the same name as the instance name just to keep things to making sense, I guess. Trying to remember it. So that's that. Now if we go to properties here, they make it super easy on us. And they'll let us copy that URL. I have a note file here to paste it in. What else do we need to get in there? A key. We can grab the key here for the storage account. Paste that in. And last thing we need is the storage account name. That's that. For extra credit here, I want to build a file share also within the same storage account. So super similar to that blob container we built. Make a file share. And these are super cool because you could get to this from basically anywhere, anywhere local or in the cloud. And instead of that URL connection, we give you a net use command line. All you have to do is drop in your um, your uh, key and your uh, sorry uh, account, uh, server, uh, storage account name. And I'll show you that in a minute. And now we'll check out those storage pools I was talking about. Here I built two storage pools. Each one has two disks in it. One of the pools is local redundant storage. The other is premium local redundant storage. I did that so I could sort of test out some uh, throughput for backup, backing things up here. So you might have a completely different setup, but hopefully you get the idea here. Those two disks are striped within each, within each of these drives we're looking at. So that's that demo. Okay, some uh, DBAs might be lucky enough to have full access to the Azure portal like we just looked at, uh, just saw in the last demo. But in many cases, the access we have um, is just gonna be like we talked about just through the, the RDP console. So I don't know about you, but uh, it's difficult for me to sort of let that go and just not know where my database backups are going, just send them off in the cloud somewhere without actually seeing where they end up. Uh, not only that, but we have a number of reasons we need to access those backup files probably. Say we need to refresh to another instance or refresh back to the, the instance we're working on, verify a sequence of transaction logs, et cetera. Uh, so that's where these Azure storage management tools come in handy. They'll allow us some degree of access to the backup files without requiring that full access uh, into the Azure portal and that and that subscription. So the first one here is storage uh, storage report. <laughs> sorry, 
Storage Explorer, the Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. It's pretty cool, and it gives you a super friendly, organized look, uh, like a Windows Explorer kind of view into the storage counts and the functionality. Uh, it's, it's all there, kind of the same functionality, just to, to do just about anything. You can uh, delete and copy and move stuff around, upload and download. Um, that, there's a bunch of other ones out there with a similar functionality, so uh, feel free to search around and find a favorite tool of your choice. Next one to look at here is AZ Copy, um, real similar to like a RoboCopy for the cloud, right? Uh, this does, again, just about anything you need to do as far as managing your files. You can easily write a script to call this utility so you can automate the common tasks. Uh, one advantage here is uh, you know, kind of like the whole idea here is that you don't need to log into the whole subscription. You can just access a storage account. Um, all you need is, like we talked about, that URL and the key and the storage account name. So there's kind of these three three pieces to that, uh, to allowing a DBA to access that stuff. Next one to look at is PowerShell. So PowerShell can access things on that individual storage account level or the whole subscription if you like. Uh, of course, you can pretty much literally do any, anything and everything within Azure with PowerShell, including all this storage account administration we're talking about. Uh, maybe the drawback is that it's going to take a bit longer to get to know those commandlets. Um, over the point-and-click type of interface of the Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer we looked at earlier, but um, probably time well spent. I know I'm trying to always get uh, get better at that stuff. So if you want to uh, take a look and download these tools, or a number of other ones, you can search around for them. I'm sure they'll, they'll pop up with any kind of an Internet search. But you can also go here if you want to ever get this download the slide deck, um, you can just get the SDK tools. All those are in there, and there's a bunch of other pretty neat stuff to poke around and play with. Uh, last one to take a look at is good old Management Studio, familiar to all of us. So this has its own kind of viewer, and here you can connect and take a look at the backups available uh, in your storage container, storage account and container from Management Studio. And that might be really all you need and uh, if you need to restore something, uh, especially like a recovery kind of situation. But other than deleting files, you don't really get much more than that kind of viewer out of this tool. So that was a pretty quick tour. But uh, if we go to the demo here, get a little more familiar with these a couple of these tools. Same deal, I'll just kind of talk over it. It's just a silent movie style, but it's color. So this is Storage Explorer. You can see it's a very Windows Explorer kind of thing. Here we're drilling down into that local redundant storage that I showed you in the last demo. You can see those same two uh, disks. So we decided we didn't want to take backups there. We built this other storage account. And in the blobs, we'll find our container. And there's at least one backup I dropped in there earlier. So you get an idea of all the stuff you can do, upload, download, delete, move, copy, etc. Now here I want to show you real quick that file share we made. Like I said, I just dropped the key and the storage account name into that net command, uh, net use command. And I, could, and I map this X drive to that file share up in the cloud. And here I already have a couple backups sitting in there. This is AZ copy. It's already built this command here. That's going to copy those backup files from that file share over into our blob container. It does take a minute. A drink of water. Watching paint dry. Oh, there you go. 
and then this one's PowerShell. So I already downloaded uh, PowerShell for Azure on this box. First thing we're going to do is import the PowerShell module. I'm going to use sort of get and set commands. I'm basically going to run a file directory on that on that container that we just copied those files over into. If you could see it, or if you wanted to poke around close enough, you'd see that those are the ones we just copied over using the, the AZ copy tool. So we'll move on to SQL database options. First thing I want to talk about, first option for SQL Server on Azure VM, is this kind of third-party backup using VDI and VSS file copies. So these applications like Azure Backups or Windows Server Backup or any number of other third-party tools, Avamar or NetBackup are the ones I've been working with lately, uh, are intended to back up the entire system, right, by snapshotting the files and sending them off to some kind of centralized backup storage location. So that could work for SQL Server in a couple ways. Uh, one way is to allow the app to snapshot the MDF and LDF data, data files just like every other file it does. Um, if, it's able, if it is able to, to do this, if you, if you allow this kind of thing, what happens is a SQL writer or that VVS service uh, freezes access to the data for just a moment and that moment's long enough to make a copy of it, uh, and then they send them off to storage. So we have copied off MDF and LDFs. Um, this service, it'll also mark in the, uh, in the MSDB database that the backup was taken, and you also know the IO frozen message in the SQL error log usually. Uh, also, that backup destination is detailed. Uh, also, in the SQL error log, is, is a virtual backup. Could, this could kind of work okay, uh, depending on your situation, but... Uh, the main trouble here is it's, it's hard to get those back out. It would be hard to restore from. Not exactly sure where they go. It might be difficult to find them or, you know, have to build a whole process around getting those back. And then it's not like an easy native equal restore. You're going to have to attach that stuff. Uh, it's, uh, further, uh, furthermore, it's, um, you don't get the same kind of point in time recovery as you would with a native and full uh, uh, T log, T log backups. Sorry, native full NT log backups. Uh, so the second way this could work uh, is if you exclude that directory holding the MDF and LDF files, whatever your directory where your database files are, and you make sure to include whatever directory the native backups are going to. Uh, so you just take native backups to that directory and make sure that thing is snapshotting that database, that uh, directory. So in that case, the file scrape software here we're talking about would back up and archive your back and trans files. Um, so that could be pretty cool, uh, and it might be something you will work with uh, in conjunction with some of the other things we're going to talk about here. But again, the issue sort of is ensuring a, a quick and easy uh, restore. Um, so if those are tough to access, then it may not be the best solution. So if you don't want to work with either of these two options, the solution to keep things simple and kind of keep, keep everything down to a single backup solution is to disable that VS service, the SQL Writer service. Uh, you might want to, of course, talk to your OS team to make sure you're not compromising their DR kind of solutions. But um, if you turn that SQL Writer off, uh, you can do it just by uh, within that within service manager on your OS. Uh, and that'd be sure there's no, like, surprise snapshotting of your SQL data files that interfere or uh, duplicate the work of your real backups. So I kind of mentioned this just because I see it a lot of times built into the Azure VM images that kind of get handed off to me. Okay, now we'll get into the SQL part of it, back up to URL. Uh, so if you're familiar with T-SQL backup statement, this is pretty familiar stuff. We'll just swap out disk or URL and add our credential information. So that credential, SQL credential, uses the storage account name and the access key we got from the Azure portal. We copied off into that notepad file. Uh, the only missing piece is the container name, which is that sort of subdirectory we already talked about. Um, and the one thing to mention here is there's no way to purge those older backups, say you have, you know, maybe you want to keep a month or three days or whatnot of backups. 
this won't allow you to really access it on that level. So you have to kind of roll your own PowerShell script or something, or maybe work with your cloud admin, see if they can build some kind of a, a workflow process to clean those up. Next one here is manage backups. Uh, they use all the same objects kind of as the backup to URL. We need that storage account, the key, and a credential. Uh, one interesting kind of wrinkle here is we don't need that container. This thing's going to build its own container, which comes out sort of as a GUID sort of uh, number. Uh, so we can enable and configure uh, via Management Studio, um, at least in 2014 we can. And uh, of course, we could also do it in T-SQL. Uh, in this case, we're just kind of keeping it simple, and we'll look at the, the SSMS sort of version of it. Uh, on top of that, we can say uh, we can enable it for the entire server so that all new databases coming in will automatically be enabled for managed backups. And we, uh, using a sort procedure, we can exclude uh, certain, back, certain databases that we may not want to have within the Manage backup sort of scope, right? Um, and I, I kind of go through that in the demo. So that well, that one little trick that caught me before was that I enabled it at the server level, but the existing databases, you have to go in there and actually manually manually turn those on to get manage backup work, manage backups working on those. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that. Sort of poking around 2016, I see there's a bunch of changes to this whole uh, tool, basically this whole picture. Um, so kind of can't get too comfortable with uh, 2014. It looks like a lot of this is going to change for 2016. But uh, anyway, here's how the sort of default scheduling goes. Every week you get a full backup. Every time the log grows over a gig, you get a full backup. Anytime the log chain breaks, full backup. The new database or, and or every two hours you get a log backup. When uh, the space used in the log file is 5 meg or greater, you get a log backup. And after a full backup, you get a log backup. So in theory, that should kind of have you covered. You can sort of set it and forget it. Uh, and if you're kind of nervous about it or not sure where your backups are going, you can always scan on things uh, if you go back to those tools we talked about in the last uh, section. Uh, last one here I want to talk about is backup to the Windows Azure tool. So we have backups to URL for SQL 2012. I think it's uh, Service Back 2, and it might be CU U4. Anyway, somewhere in there they backported it, so it works in uh, 2012. And we have managed backups for 2012 and later, but that kind of leaves us in the cold for SQL 2008 and SQL 2005 which there's still plenty of around. And that's where this tool comes in handy. Microsoft, uh, what do we call it? Yeah, SQL Backup to Windows Azure, Azure tool. Uh, this is a service kind of runs on that SQL box. Basically, it's going to watch. It's a watcher. It watches the directory that you tell it to. When a SQL backup file lands in that directory via a native backup, probably done by a, the SQL agent, uh, that service grabs it, can optionally compress it and or encrypt it, and it sends it up to the Azure storage account. In its place, it leaves behind a little metadata file, a little tag file, which is kind of a pointer to where the real backup lives in the storage account. So when you do need to restore that file, a standard T-SQL restore command within SQL Server will work on that meta file. The service is smart enough to see what's going on. It forwards that kind of request, request to restore it up to the, the storage account in Azure, finds that account, pulls it down, and allows SQL to restore it. So uh, what's more, in this case, those meta files, in case they get lost on the local side, they're also copied up to the Azure storage account. So in case there's sort of an issue or a, a disaster kind of deal on your uh, SQL server side, those metadata tag files are still available, and you can copy them back down and, and use them to restore a database anywhere else. Um, the other really cool thing about this tool is that we don't have to use it to send things to the cloud. We can take a local backup here and just build this uh, rule so that 
the backups stay local, but we get all the cool things out of 2000, was it 2012 and 2014, actually going back to 2008 for compression, 2014 for database encryption, uh, we can add those things kind of back, port them to our 2005 and 2008 instances, and we don't have to send those to the cloud, we can just keep them local. So now you can compress a 2005 and encrypt a 2005 uh, database backup. A couple of times I've mentioned that when backing things up to Azure Storage, we have a harder time purging those old backups than you know we might if we just were backing it up to a local disk. So this is a good time to show you this link, uh, this Stack Overflow question that Paul White asked, um, which he answers a lot of questions, so it's kind of funny to see him ask one. Um, but it has a nice little Power, uh, PowerShell script example in here to purge old backups uh, to keep our uh, storage account containers kind of down to size. Next thing to go over here is very large databases. So one thing I'm hoping to get across here is that it works really well to kind of commit to this new world or the new cloud, whatever you want to call it. You can send your backups to Azure Storage rather than to a local disk on your Azure machine. So for one thing, uh, for all practical purposes, there's not really any difference between those two things, disks or the blob storage. It's all the same cloud storage behind the curtains. It's just a different way of accessing it. Uh, the other reason is that it's best to use those disks that we have on the SQL Server for data, not backed up data. Since it's a bit of a waste to back up something, have a backup file sitting there, say on like an expensive premium disk that could be put to much better use in a storage pool. So that's all great, but it kind of all goes out the window with these very large databases. I kind of ran into this recently with really just a moderate sized SharePoint database. It turned out to be a lot faster to back it up to a local disk on my Azure VM than to try to send it out to Azure Storage because I was able to stripe uh, the backup Strip the backup set, and you can't do that yet, uh, at least not yet, when you're backing up to a URL. So I sacrificed the disk for local backups. And now I have this sort of split solution where I'm backing up one pretty large database to a, in a Stripe set to a local disk, and the rest of my databases are getting backed up via URL to an Azure Storage account. So the things that will stop you when you're trying to figure out how to back up your large database uh, to Azure Storage is uh, it's not five, it should be 500 terabyte limit on standard storage accounts. So that's not going to slow you down too much, probably, unless you have a seriously big database. But if that doesn't stop you, then these other things will. You get a one terabyte limit on the blobs, so any backup file can only be one terabyte. Uh, you can't strike backups to URL, but that's coming in 2006, and we'll touch on that later. And uh, I'll other thing to think about is this throttling on the bandwidth per VM size. So for instance, that DS2 that we talked about uh, can go to 64 megs per second, um, but that's it. So if you have a really big backup, it could take a long time to send it over to Wazer Storage uh, that way. So how can we get around some of this? Any one of these or a mixed bag of these workarounds could be a solution, right? Uh, you can do multiple database files, still do your native backups, but do file backups or file group backups. As long as your uh, files are under a terabyte, you should be able to back those up into Azure Storage. Multiple backup files, uh, basically that's kind of what I just explained where I'm striping my backup uh, for that SharePoint database I mentioned. A local dedicated backup disk, kind of the same thing I just talked about. I have a dedicated disk, and I just use that for my one SharePoint database. Everything else goes off uh, to the cloud via, via uh, backing up to URL. As long as we have that local disk, we have different ways we can think about making it faster and making, a, making that backup fast, that large backup fast. Use storage pools and RAID 1, RAID 1 it so you can speed things up. Uh, we can make it a... Uh, SSD, we can use premium local redundant storage on that and see if that will help super uh, speed it up to another notch. Um, what else, like say you needed some kind of redundancy, you could use that file share that we built 
uh, maybe that file share could be on a geo-redundant service account, or sorry, storage account. Uh, we can copy the copy a big backup onto that, and it's going to replicate off to a um, replicate off to a different region. Not a per se solution for a very large database, but I think I dropped it in here just because it seems cool. In case you do need sort of like a DR level uh, replication for a, any database, and then of course you can scale up the Azure VM to get away from that uh, storage bandwidth throttle. So this next slide here shows a little experiment I was working on, um, try to get a feel for different differences in backup throughput based on some of the different options we just sort of went over. So my large database is not really very large, but you can see I tried um, Stripe backup sets, I tried premium versus standard storage, I used buffer count argument. Nothing really stands out here as a you know a whiz bang, but uh, you can kind of see that uh, that LRS via the URL, that was the fastest, not super fast, but it was the fastest, and, and it looks like it hit that bandwidth limit of 64 megs per second. So anyway, not uh, too dramatic here, but kind of what's more important is that I wanted to show you is that I just whipped this up uh, using a couple of few storage accounts and a test box. I built the whole thing in like 10, 15 minutes or something, and that's really one reason Azure is just so cool because we as DBAs can sort of set this up for ourselves. We can get in there. We can try 15 different ideas out, or 20. We can poke around, put it in a chart or something, find the best option, and then bring it back and apply it to our production servers. So we don't really need a, any kind of other lab or anything. We can just go out into Azure, Azure, uh, sorry, Azure build, our, build a SQL box, a couple of storage accounts, and try to figure out what's going to work the best for us right then and there. Uh, there's a lot more on this uh, kind of testing, what's the fastest as far as uh, backups goes. Uh, if you look at this link right here to uh, Igor's uh, blog, kind of cool stuff. He's got a lot of good stuff out there, so look at that guy. Where are we going next? To demo. So we're going to look at backing up uh, to URL manage backups and that Microsoft backup, uh, SQL backup to Windows Azure tool that I talked about. Again, I'll just try to talk over it. So here's our three key things that I kind of keep pointing out, storage account name, URL, storage key. Here's the SQL credential we had to build, called a backup guy. Username and password is the storage account name and the key. Use the URL and the credential and back this database up to storage account. In case you don't believe me, here's a restore file list only. You can see that. Uh, from the URL, we're able to restore that file. I didn't show you this uh, tool. It's one of our management tools, right? Uh, so here we're going to look at our storage account from SQL Server Management Studio. See a number of the backups. Some of those ones we copied in there in that last demo. Look at management back, uh, managed backups. Enabled it for server-wide, 30 days retention. This is our backup guy. A URL, we don't need a container because it builds its own container. And here's the proc we use. You can change a number of different things about a particular database. In this case, we're just going to disable managed backups for this test DB. Here's our backup to SQL Azure tool. We're going to build a rule that looks in this directory and add this filter so it's going to look for .back files. So 
storage account name, key, container, Here's where you can decide to choose to encrypt or compress. And there's a rule. So you could have a number of different rules in here for different directories, different filters, like, uh, say, for instance, a .tran, a TRN. And here's, I uh, took a backup to this here. The service picked it up and left this tag file. So if we needed to restore, we just restore this tag file, and the service is smart enough to basically forward that request out to the storage account and bring it back for SQL to restore. That's the end of that demo. You get questions about this? I'm no expert here, but I did want to kind of do a Mythbuster slide here just to make sure we all know that yes, as of I think it was V12, uh, SQL Azure databases are getting backed up. It's all built in, it's all automatic, it's geo-redundant, it's point and timey. You get seven, 14, or 35 days uh, depending on your depending on your service tier, and somewhere back there behind the scene, these backups are living in a storage account. It's kind of like the cloud to cloud or something. So I'm not sure. I kind of infer that the mechanism that is driving these backups for this thing kind of the same as what's going on in managed backups uh, in 2014, 2016. And it's also kind of interesting to me anyway that uh, there must be a GRS account back there somewhere. In the background, just like the one we the ones we we looked at today, that's hosting these backups. So these guys, uh, Microsoft, can say they're geo redundant. So anyway, if you do need to restore, you can't see these as .back files, as far as I know, anyway. Uh, but you can kind of click through the portal to restore a uh, point in time, or of course, you can do it in PowerShell. And just about to wrap up here. Um, talks about mostly up to. SQL 2014 today because in um, part uh, I'm still working on the 2016 pieces, uh, but I do uh, kind of want to go over a few things I think we can look forward to learning in 2016 as far as the backups go. So that very large database backup thing more or less solved uh, to some degree since we'll have block blobs instead of page blobs and we'll be able to stripe a backup uh, to a URL via URL. Uh, there's changes for Mac, uh, managed backups. We'll have custom schedules, uh, support for all backup types, not just um, full and tran. Uh, so we'll get diff, diff in there. And for all databases, so we'll not just it won't just be user databases, uh, which it is now. You can't do system databases. Uh, if you start reading up on managed backups and comparing them, uh, comparing books online, uh, documentation, 2014 to 2016, you'll start to see that just about everything seems to be changing there. So um, I'm going to be learning, learning up on that. Uh, and what's the other one here? Uh, I think uh, back in 2014, uh, you were able to start using a UNC path to host your, put your uh, database files on. There's a trace flag before that, but as of 2014, they took that off and. It seemed kind of weird at the time, but I'm, I don't know if this sort of this led into this. But uh, in 2016, we can start hosting our database files on one of these storage accounts directly. So no disk, we just need that uh, URL path that we've kind of looked at today into the storage account. And if we do begin doing that, then there's this technology now called File Snapshot Backup, which is basically going to instantly back up the data. So I don't know much on it yet. More or less just came across it as building this presentation, but uh, that we all be learning much more about it in the near future. So to wrap up, last picture, pterodactyl. Um, let's have a quick view. Uh, this is what works for me anyway, as far as backing up databases on a SQL Server running in an Azure VM. Uh, use local redundant storage, keep things practical and cheap. Uh, you can bump up to SSDs, premium local room storage, faster but pricier. Uh, Geo-redundant and even read-ahead read access geo-redundant are kind of cool options, uh, especially if you really need some more serious DR kind of replication for those backup files. Try to dedicate the disks that you attach to SQL Server Azure Box for data 
trying not to use them for backups kind of is a bit strange, it was for me anyway, and kind of a bit hard to get used to. But once you think about it, behind the scenes, everything, all the storage is living on the storage account anyway, so there's not a real difference practically. And you'll probably be make, making better use of the disk storage for your database and your data, especially if it's premium, uh, if, you, if you don't put your backup files on there. Manage your backup file using one or more of the tools we reviewed. Um, it's nice because as a DBA, you might not have access to the Azure subscription, uh, but you can still get in there and do what you need to do uh, with your storage account. And on, uh, in that same vein, we've got to try to uh, purge the old backups using PowerShell. Uh, hopefully that'll keep things cheaper, especially if you're kind of uh, paying for what you use on a local redundant storage. Uh, keep things simple, and if you can, look at disabling that SQL Writer service if it's running and you're getting those file snapshots. Uh, that'll get rid of those I.O. freezes. Probably no big deal, but anything I can do to clean up the error log I like to try to do. Uh, and then you're going to get rid of out-of-band kind of full backups as well. Uh, use the backup to URL or manage backups, um, depending on kind of what you need and your sort of personal tolerance to let go of that control, uh, but uh, I can attest that uh, the stuff that I have set up using this stuff works great so far. And lastly, use that backup tool for uh, the backup to Azure tool we looked at. Use that for your 2005 and 2008 instances. instances. Um, pretty cool in Azure, but also pretty neat to uh, put that on your on-premise boxes for your older uh, SQL versions and compress the backups. So, that wraps it up for me. Thanks for listening. Let us know if you have questions. Thanks for DBTA for hosting this, and I'll hand it back to Stephen. Thank you very much, Andy. At this point, we're going to move on to questions from our attendees today, and the first question is, can you turn off compression for deduplication? What I can say to that is, uh, for instance, this compression tool uh, went yeah, I would turn – I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to leave that one out there. You can email me and we can we can poke around at it. But. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, next question, can I back up my on-premises SQL Server database and restore on Azure using the management tools? Yep, you should be able to do that. You can back up to Azure Storage from SQL 2014 on-premise. And then you could use those tools to restore it or copy it up, or you should be able to restore it directly uh, from your storage account onto an Azure or SQL Server. Understood. Our next question, moving SQL Server that was functioning earlier on a single server physical node onto a VM node has slowed the functioning of SQL Server and applications accessing it by a considerable amount. Does VM need more CPU or memory comparatively? That sounds like one you would have to dig into later. Uh, we're on kind of off topic too, since we're talking since that's a VM question, I think. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Our next question: uh, What version of SQL can I use managed backups in? Sorry, say it again. Uh, what, what? Version, uh, what version of SQL can I use managed backup in? And oh, it starts – yeah, 2014 managed backups starts in 2014. Understood. And can you back up to that file share you mentioned? Uh, yeah, you could, but you'd have to add a couple twists. You want your SQL Server to sort of map that drive itself kind of like an old style uh, when we used to back up to file shares. So that would be one thing you'd have to think about if you wanted to set that up. Understood. That is all the time we have for questions today. We apologize that we were unable to get to all your questions, but as I stated earlier, all questions will be answered via email. I'd like to thank our speaker today, Andy McDermott, Full Server DBA at DataVail. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, please use the same URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived 
and you will receive an email tomorrow once the archive is posted. Plus, if you would like a PDF of this presentation, you can click on the resource icon at the bottom of your console. Now, as we stated earlier, just for participating in today's event, someone would win a $100 American Express gift card. And the winner today is Jim Nelson. Jim, we will be in touch with you email so you can claim your prize. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.